You are listening to the Brain Software Podcast. This is episode 199 coming at you from the World Hypnotic Epicenter, Toronto, Canada. Today, Mike Mandel and I discuss some awesome things that we've learned from other hypnotists. So keep listening or watching. Disclaimer. Warning. You listen to this podcast at your own risk because we're hypnotists. So we can make you do anything, anything at all. Lucci. <laughs> hey, everybody. It's great to be here in the Hypnotic World Epicenter, Toronto, Canada. I've always wanted to come to Toronto and take a short trip to Niagara Falls, too. Oh, get to the point, son. You're rambling again, and I don't want to hear any Ken Sweatman stories from you. Oh, okay, Dad. It's just that I thought it would be cool to climb up all the 1,776 stairs to the top of the CN Tower. Whoa, hold on there, Sir Edmund Hillary. Take a breath from your oxygen bottle and calm down. It sounds like someone's getting too big for his britches. Remember, you're still just Danny. Yeah, I guess so, Dad. You guessed damn right, Sherpa. So let's welcome to the North Face of Trance, the only hypnotist on Earth who never needs crampons. The man who's recently wrenched his back shoveling snow, and the Keith Richards of hypnosis, Mike Mandel! Yes, Christopher! Oh, I snapped my neck a bit there. Yeah, and my back is just off the scale weird. Shoveling snow, big, heavy shovel fulls of really wet, heavy oh. snow. So, anyway, Why even bother uh, when it's cause, melting? Because I'm married. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. By the way, did you really like, did you like how I slipped from the, the Danny's father voice right into the Chris Thompson Actually, intro voice? Actually, that was really nice. It was just come to think of it, it was very well done. Smoothly, like a little dissolve of the audio it, nature. Pretty much. Right. Now, realize today is all about what we have learned from other hypnotists. And the answer is nothing. <laughs> Not a damn thing. No one could teach us anything. So that's the end of this podcast. Chris, what's the empowering question? Oh, hmm. I think we could probably think of a few Did things we learned. <laughs> okay, let's take it away. We got think tank okay. words, though. So we're going to, yeah, we're going to do the think tank words, which are designed to cause stimulate. some unconscious we, we stimulation of, a, a of ideas and resources yeah. to see how they work their way into the conversation. Mm. And the conversation will all be about what we have learned from some of our best friends in the hypnosis industry and others, or other great trainers, yes. et cetera. Yeah. And yes. not, not just our And friends, even some but, mediocre mm. trainers going back in history who yeah, had some good right. points. All right. Excellent. So let's go with the think tank. The first one is mm. basis. Ooh, what is the basis for that? Mm. Let's give all three. The second is university. Ooh. There's a word you'd know, Chris. Yes. And the third one you'd really know, it is marketing. Marketing. And these are well, randomly generated. So let's start with basis. What, so what do you glad. get from this? Again, I, I just the, HMI, no. the basis ah. of me knowing I have the comfort of understanding all three words again this week. That's good. That's very good. <laughs> basis, I think baseline. Basis, baseline. What is okay. the what is the rationale? What is the reason for thinking a certain thing? What is the reason for believing? What's the basis behind it? Now it's funny perhaps. you said baseline because there's a baseline mm -hmm. in Ottawa. Yeah. As you know, the street is the called baseline, baseline road. Yeah. And I knew a guy and he actually said, Oh yeah, you turn left at Vaseline. Was, I think you're I'm telling like, this story crazy. You, you thought it was I, Vaseline. Buddy, I think you're making up a story from my own life because when I was 10 years old about to turn 11 we moved from montreal to ottawa and when we passed that road i said oh basiline road it must be a common thing because yeah, bob gray was there he well, i was a story. kid and i knew that you know on the on the <laughs> itchy nose bathroom still. counter we'd have a thing of vaseline yeah and i we're thought not going there basiline okay made okay sense. so My the basis of this is let's get the word right let's start yeah there, there we go so we? basis what do you get from basis basis means uh, foundation yeah so i'm jumping to foundation i'm thinking that there's foundational principles with mm -hmm. hypnosis again so this is all about foundational principles and key distinctions that we've learned from other hypnotists and isn't that awesome because we're actually just at the cusp of launching foundations live which is a hybridized live and online video training for our hypnosis students so that's kind of cool more noticing, about that later <laughs> noticing um, how well chris almost like it's the university of he hypnosis he turns to him. Hmm. all right second word university university mm. well remember university is a composite word meaning unity in diversity that's the whole point. Oh, and that's interesting. why they bring in all these diverse things. And they unite in their unite, diverse learning and diverse at least under everything. the name of the mm -hmm. university or something like that. Yeah. And university comes from universal as well, mm -hmm. not universal studios necessarily. I'm thinking uh, the basis of any university has to be 
cooperation, mm -hmm. but with diversity as well. That's a great thing. Uh, it's apparently not very good English on my part, but I, I like that because if we're bringing across lots of different areas of knowledge and we're, we're universally grouping them together yeah. into one organization, that's the way that we think about teaching too, right? You can teach hypnosis, you can teach personal growth, whatever it is, but you've got to constantly be in a state of learning and bringing in new resources. That's good. So we are collectively bringing in new stuff to our own brains right? and, and we're, using and, that to teach. And we're also drawing from all these mm -hmm. other hypnotists to bring in a universal hypnotic method that draws from all these sources. So yes. we're, we're making it work. This is good. Now, how about marketing? Okay. I'm going to give you that one. Well... Usually I go with the word and then that word inspires something that sounds like the word. In this case, I'm going to say marketing is about emotions. Marketing wow. is the same as relationships, except oftentimes it's just with a brand or an unknown person or whatever. But if you think about marketing, marketing is about influencing people in a way that's going to help them in some way or hopefully help both of you, right? So an exchange of services or ideas or training, whatever it is. So how do you influence people? You've got to manufacture emotions. And I was having a conversation with you this morning over coffee yes. about how if you think about yourself as a manufacturer of human emotions you can get a lot done. Right? Are you talking about manufacture of human emotions in self or others? Both. <gasps> I think it's, you see, it's there's now the when marketing. it, and when it comes to others, in fact, you're not really the manufacturer so much because you don't run their machinery. They are the manufacturer, but you're feeding the inputs or at least you're part of the inputs. And as um, one of our students, Desiree pointed out in a reply to my email, you're also looking at the quality control end of the loop. What comes out of the machine and back in, you can calibrate that and go, oh, I'm I'm inputting junk. So if your marketing message, garbage if you want to think about it from a marketing perspective yeah, or a human relationship perspective, it's all pretty much the same. You're looking to help people make a decision that's going to benefit them and hopefully it benefits you. If it's a business, it should be two-way street. All of yeah. which is taught at Ken Sweatman University. Mm -hmm. Now, listen. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was, brilliant, that was, that was very funny. Now, listen, very funny. I knew. I said at one that. training we did once, I said- the unconscious mind is a manufacturer and the conscious mind is a consumer. Ooh, And I thought yeah. that was freaking profound. That and I've got good. this horrible feeling that Erickson might have said at first, like so many things that I think I've come up with and I've read in the, you know, 60 trillion, <laughs> by no exaggeration, yeah. hypnosis. Well, I'm so pretty right. sure the Vaseline story is actually a distortion of what I told you when I moved oh, there I from many years Bob ago. I can see Bob Gray sure. in the yeah. story. And, yeah. you know, I think I, it was even when I was on Margaret Trudeau's TV show. No. I think it was that time. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> okay. So let's get on with this. You <laughs> okay. so, so that's where we see where this all fits in. We're now going to move on and talk about what we've learned from other hypnotists. Okay. And you said in no particular order. No particular order. order. Oh, I see why. Because so you're starting with Mesmer. We're starting with Franz Anton Mesmer. So we're, mm. we're clearly in the 1700s here, which is 18th century for those of you new to understanding the calendar but <laughs> what is interesting about this i don't want some dick right oh, the 1700s funny. or the 17th century are you stupid no but you are um the mesmer remember he did all his mesmeric stuff he set up his backette with iron filings and water and bottles and rods yeah. and would come in with the turban on and they he all had his the stuff prestige. the music he the prestige the, yeah. the incense the candles he had so much prestige Okay, you could say the lesson is we have learned prestige from Mesmer. I, I will grant I, I him that. I would say that. And we we argue sometimes that you <laughs> he did not bring anything to scientific hypnosis. Oh, we're getting there. But, Here's what I find interesting. But with prestige, <laughs> I suppose prestige, there is psychological well, science Well, it's the term for the bag man it, right? of Edward the Confessor. We've yes, really got to say Edward the Confessor had it first <laughs> because that's about 1000 AD. That's so true. So Edward the Confessor came in around when they were building Notre Dame Cathedral so this is literally about 700 years at least before Mesmer. Jeez. So we're not going to give Mesmer that. Um, well, at least he applied it to hypnosis. Right. Well, sort of. Applied it to mesmerism. That's the yeah, problem. Which, so okay. this has got I Dick written all over it. Because what Mesmer did was he draws these conclusions. Oh, you know, misses <clears throat> his magnets one day when he's trying to stop a, a vein do you want from to give bleeding. The, do you want to give a quick history of this? Super quick. Uh, Mesmer studied with um, Father Father Hell. Uh, who was a, a Jesuit priest, Maximilian. Maximilian Hell. And what they did was they would use Paracelsus' as methods of lodestones, magnetite, magnets. naturally occurring magnets, open a vein, bleed, do bloodletting, pass the magnet over the bleeding would stop. We now know the indirect suggestion causes platelet aggregation 
And why would they do bloodletting, Mike? They did it for every kind of disease. They thought you had too many poisonous humors in your blood of four different types. Open this a was vein. the sanguine one. You have to open the vein. George Washington died from that, but that's a different story. The bottom line is, Mesmer didn't have his lodestones one day. His patient's bleeding all over the place. He grabs a, he a wooden faked pointer. It, in other words. <laughs> yeah, grabs a wooden pointer from the blackboard because you need a wooden pointer. <laughs> you got a freaking blackboard, right? We don't know if it was equipped. an actual wooden pointer. And then pointer. the hand goes behind the back. And yeah. It was a wooden pointer. Okay. Was yes, it? We, we do know. All right. My source was that. Tad James for this. Okay. Passes the pointer over. Amazingly, the bleeding stops. Platelets aggregate. You get a clot. Now, so belief in belief. the other person was the, the basis. basis. Oh, we got the word in there because it was actually Dr. Krasner who said belief plus anticipation equals hypnosis, which uh, is really powerful uh, stuff. All right. So that's what Krasner gave us. But back to Mesmer. Mesmer doesn't go. Huh? It's it's, it's obviously nothing to magnets. do with the magnets. It must be me. I have mesmeric power. I'm mesmer man. And so he he took narcissism to a new level. He is Magneto boy. He was Magneto mm -hmm. boy, first X-Men. So the lesson is don't be a freaking narcissist when you're doing hypnosis. That's why he contributed nothing of scientific value. He led us down a rabbit so hole he, of wackiness for a long time. He believed he had these magnetic powers, right? And this was the basis of everything else that he did. Animal in what magnetism. He yeah. So accidentally he taught us the power of prestige animus magnetissimus right. Right. and the danger of it is uh he became a hypnotic rock star the and he first. believed and he, his own great power so much did. so that he never inquired what was really going on i think of more as the justin bieber of hypnosis <laughs> than anything else you know believing in his own great power despite any evidence of talent so that's just a personal opinion but oh. I, i'm a hypnotist so i'm right now <laughs> here's what's interesting about this I've noticed the presupposition that That's as soon so as one funny. becomes a hypnotist, yeah, they have they're, they're right correct. about everything. So and a, and Mesmer contributed intro. nothing, but I will say he was the first hypnotic rock star. When he moved to Paris, anybody who was anybody went to be treated by him. He treated the aristocracy and he did get mm -hmm. some phenomenal results after mesmeric convulsions. But we're going to go we're skip ahead away from the narcissist now. I am Magneto Man and we'll You've move on. You've got an awesome list here. I haven't I even agree. seen this. So well, the, the next cow. one we're going to give okay. is Amon Marie Jacques de Chastanet Marquis de Pisegur. Oh, wow. We just call him Pisegur Amon for Marie short. Amon Marie Jacques de Chastanet Marquis de Pisegur. Chastanet. Uh, Chastanet. Marquis there de Pisegur. Now, That's a hard one to say. Pisegur was a mesmerist. He was a classic mesmerist. So he's coming in after Mesmer. Uh, he began experimenting with mesmeric trances with all the passes and so on. Very often, in fact, almost universally, when Mesmer did his passes, people would convulse because they thought these magnetic currents were being moved in their bodies. They'd have convulsions and then they'd oh, come wow. out of it and they'd be okay. Yeah, they do the phone. <laughs> it's chicken. okay. He's okay. He he's waving. Need any help. He's you're waving. having a freaking epileptic yeah. seizure and your friends go, oh, he's okay. He's, he's waving his off. He's, he doesn't need any help. So... <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit that out. So uh, here we have uh, de, uh, de Pisegur. He's doing this stuff, but he contributed because he had a famous patient called Victor Race. Uh -huh. He was about 23 years old. Race worked in vineyards or something. He was a, a servant for the household because Pisegur was a marquee. And Victor Race did not get the common convulsions and so on because he'd never seen it before. He didn't know that's what he was supposed to do. Okay. Instead, his eyelid blink stopped his blinking reflex stopped his face went blank and he looked like a sleepwalker and so pisagor coined the mm. term artificial somnambulism which elman uses later in a different context the idea being a somnambulist is a sleepwalker and he thought he had artificially created somnambulism so somnambulism is the working state of hypnosis okay we so today. we've also stumbled upon then this idea of expectation so if someone is expected to do the funky chicken yeah. then, then funky chicken they, they will. will and in fact we've come up with what well, were there some other examples of um like the sick court state where oh, you gosh. have to know oh. that this is what's supposed to happen would, in order for that course. thing to happen. Sick court mm -hmm. yeah, created apparently the Esdale state with rapid eye movement, which is nonsensical. That was it. Because rapid your brain is yeah. slowing down as you're going deeper into trance. And rapid eye movement occurs in alpha waves, which are very high up. So you're not going to get this response no. unless you unless know you've you're supposed to, to have guy. this yeah. response. And, and okay. Sikort would use the same patient over and over traveling to demonstrate right. this. So do you think the person was conditioned to do this? Ah, uh, duh! Okay. And also, um, Gil Boyne was there. He saw the demos. So my source is Gil Boyne said this was a bunch of crap. Okay, so and this guy, Victor Race, he didn't know he was supposed, supposed to, to have do the these funky chicken, funky chicken yeah. dances, yeah. and he just uh, went, 
he went what we call a hypnotic mask, just right? Just moved my arm too much. Uh, well, more than the hypnotic mask, full on somnambulism. All, yeah, yeah. I, I just mean I was firing an external. 870 yesterday on a range and it just in agony. Yeah. What a kick from that pecker. Now, listen. I'm going with you next time. Uh, you'll love it. Now, realize too, Pisagor again, he was asked, he did a demonstration for the Parisian Freemasons. And they asked, how was it that he could get these results all the time? He said he formed a mental image of what he wanted to happen happening. Mm -hmm. Then he believed that image was true. And then he did what he believed. Oh, and he got these incredible expectations expectation and belief. <clears throat> we, got, we got it there. So let's move on. All right. So Abhi Faria. next? Abhi Faria was Portuguese and Hindu. He was born in Goa, India where they have some great foods because it was on the trade route and the Portuguese sailors would stop there. They got Portuguese recipes, Portuguese in immigrants with Indian spices and made oh some really interesting goodness. foods. Making so Abi Faria was a Hindu convert to Roman Catholicism. That's when he became an Abbe. And what he did was he is the he contributed something of great interest. He was the first to use shock inductions. Okay, which most people don't know. Explain so for us, Chris. Well, I have a sip of this so perfectly shock ordinary shock inductions, i.e., and we can talk briefly about what a PGO spike means, where you're basically using shock novelty or surprise yep. to bypass the critical. I almost hit my microphone there. Uh -oh. Bypass the critical faculty mm. and allow suggestions to slip in, like sleep now, for example, and in the presence of rapport and well rapport really because if the client believes that you're there to help them etc or they're part of an entertainment show or whatever right, it right. is whatever the context is they're going to be accepting of hypnosis and this would be a very very fast we call that an instant way into hypnosis right you have to assume control mm -hmm. then or they'll come out of trance very quickly so who and, do people often well, think is in charge um, in charge of responsible for the creation of shock induction what do you mean? Who do they think is? Yeah, who do they think originated the idea of a shock induction? Uh, well, Faria is the one who did. So yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, don't know who. He, no, yeah. it is him because even Sean Michael Andrews, when he gave me the challenge coin, Sean he Michael told Andrews, you this. world's fastest. Mm. No, I asked him, world's fastest hypnotist. I looked on the back of it and I said, "Is that Abi Faria?" And he said, "Yes, it is." Yeah. So he even credits, and Sean uses a lot of shock inductions. Okay, there so you go. He credits Faria. Faria would come on stage or into the room with the people waiting, and he. He, he learned French. He spoke Hindu and Portuguese, but he learned French. Although they, the literature says he never got the accent right, uh, okay. which is like my friend Gary. He tried to learn French, but he always thought he had to talk through his nose. Uh -huh. So he'd say, Tony Edouard. I say, why are you going? Tony? Just say Tony Edouard. <laughs> It just sounded like a freaking lunatic. So anyway, I guess Faria might have sounded like a lunatic, but he'd enter the room and yell, Dorme! And everybody would conk out and fall into trance, and then he'd take control. So he this... Of course, shock inductions, I said, are used with great effect, were used by Gil Boyne all the mm -hmm, time for mm -hmm. his therapy and for Sean Michael Andrews. A lot of people are by him. A lot of people don't realize shock inductions will produce just as deep a trance as a slow laborious induction, sometimes even more so. Yes. And I really like Sean Michael Andrews' contribution of what he calls the NEWS acronym for yes. safety check, right? Make sure that your client, before doing any kind of instant induction, has no problems with their NEWS, N-E-W-S. Neck. Elbow, elbow, wrist, or and shoulder, shoulder like yeah, your shoulder yeah, yeah, today. Yeah. You wouldn't Shut want up. me doing an instant induction on you. Well, you know how I do it. I do it at the points of the compass because then it's in north, sequence. Yeah. North, east, south, east, east west. and west. Right. There we go. You see? All right. Always a little bit better, even than Sean, our friend. As, as a kid, I think I learned it as never Kidding. eat shredded worms. Used to be shredded wheat. We need some crickets used to be there, shredded, I think. Used to be shredded wheat, but it yeah. got changed to shredded worms because it just seems much more disgusting. Yeah, and for me, it would be All shredded right. inflammation. <laughs> now, listen. Oh. Now, this brings us to, um, we have Bernheim, Bernheim and Lebo. And Lebo. Bernheim and mm. Lebo worked together at the Nancy Clinic in Nancy, France. They had an ongoing war, especially Bernheim, against Charcot. Charcot fits firmly in the dick category, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and I can say so that because I'm Mike Van Frickendale. Yeah. But here's the thing. I'm kidding, but Charcot, the reason I don't like him so much is with the research I've done, it appears that Charcot, who tried to revive mesmerism, even when it was falling out of favor, he tied it to hysteria. And he thought hysterical women were exhibiting hypnosis. But what he did, a hypnotic states, what he did was it appears that Charcot only worked with young, attractive women, oh. which is a huge hmm. freaking red flag, red flag, red flag for red Charcot, flags guys. On that. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I, he, oh, he warred, I nice, he warred with Lebo and Bernheim. Bernheim heard that Lebo had cured sciatica with hypnosis. Bernheim was a neurologist. He said, this is crap. He met Lebo, realized he was a consummate theoretician and, and researcher, and they partnered. And Bernheim and Lebo worked with a lot of medical disorders out of Nancy, France. Their contribution was 
they did all of this with direct suggestion. Okay, so direct suggestion in hypnosis came from these guys. Right, and this is all documented in suggestive therapeutics. Okay, so next on our list, Mike, we've got James Bray. Right. Up in Manchester, England, some say he was English, some say he was Scottish, some say he was an MD, some say he was an eye doctor. Doesn't matter. He went and saw La Fontaine do a hypnosis demonstration, actually mesmerism, thought it was interesting. Braid was having one of his patients stare at a, a lighted desk, comes back in, the person's gone... Uh, they've gone into trance yeah. braid gave us the whole idea of focusing the mind around one particular thought although he thought i focus he was thought it necessary. had to be eye yeah. fixation but later but we was, discovered was anything that you're anything you focus of. wrap your mind around is going to cause this and he gave us the word hypnosis eh, wrong he didn't he was beaten to the punch by 40 years by who by etienne felix de Cuvier. So Braid wanted to call it neurohypnology and monoideism and all these other things, but hypnotism stuck. But the Frenchman came up with it first. Braid stuff led to focused attention. It led to swinging watches, spirals, all of that. He really founded all of that eye focus stuff. Okay, so at this point, people didn't yet understand that you could have people's attention focused on, for example, the feeling in that hand sure. with your eyes closed. Or, or as Erickson did, an internal, <laughs> you know, internal metronome right. ticking. So now we get to, we've said... Uh, De Cuvier, John Elliotson. This is a very interesting study. He had a checkered time doing hypnosis. He was a medical doctor. He mm -hmm. was actually a professor at the medical university. Okay, and he was I don't extremely think extremely well. Heard oh, of Elliotson's this guy. study is phenomenal. He was extremely well trained as a medical doctor, and but Elliotson really shows us the power of having a belief and your own reality tunnel that deletes stuff that does not. It does not accord with it. So in other words, the selective focus, the, um, what's the word I'm looking at? A confirmation bias. Oh, got you. If okay. we believe something intently, we will reject all information to the contrary. That's what we learned from Elliotson. The problem is he didn't teach it. He lived it. Oh. Elliotson had two young women he hypnotized all the time, Elizabeth and Jane O'Kee, and they scammed him. It was documented many times. They weren't even going into trance. They could put on different personalities. And he thought they were reading minds. And they basically scammed him for years. Oh, wow. And he kept banging his head on the wall trying to make it seem real. And it wasn't. Okay, so he fell victim of his own trance that he believed a certain situation and rejected any evidence. His to the own contrary. trance. Well put, Chris. Mm -hmm. Well put. Ding. Okay. All Point right. Which brings us to James Esdale. James Esdale. Scottish physician, oh. Cal physician, Calcutta, India, British Army. He goes to India in Calcutta. It is a hotbed of mysticism. And he begins doing mesmerism. He documents this in his amazing old book, Mesmerism, mesmerism in, in India. India. I gave Terry Mady my copy because he's mm -hmm. such I a nice man. Uh, printed in 1888 or the Ripper murder year or something of that nature. Anyway, uh, Esdale documented everything. He did like two or 300 serious operations, cut toenails out by the roots when they were inflamed and infected <laughs> and ingrown. And the uh, best part. Of course, you can say it. <laughs> this Okay, when Mike would talk about this in class, I thought he was making this up until I found a copy, a PDF version of Mesmerism in India. And sure enough, <laughs> Esdale, not only one, but several men who had very large testicular tumors, large enough that they would well, probably have to in one carry case, them in a wheelbarrow. In a wheelbarrow. <laughs> and this would be caused by elephantiasis, which is a parasite. Mm -hmm. So to have parasites in the testicles doesn't sound like a great thing. So they'd have to surgically remove them. Now, this is before ether. It's before chloroform. So and they so just cut them off. Most of that's the, it. half well, the people could, would die of shock, Which, right? again, begs the question why one waits for it to reach 80 pounds before seeking medical attention. But <laughs> as Dale would trance them out, sometimes oh. it would take up to two hours to get someone in sufficiently. The well, the hands. And the hands. No, no magnets. That's Lying right. down, passing his hands from head down to feet. They'd go into a deep trance. He, he found this state where he could do surgery, and they were completely insensate. Not only that, but they didn't feel the pain. The surgical um, mortality dropped by half. Suddenly people were surviving surgery because the shock would kill people, Chris. Yeah, that's and, what I mean. And yeah. infection. And all of this was made much easier because of his mesmerism. So he discovered that there is a state below somnambulism where one can actually do surgery. And he didn't name it, but it was then named by After him, Dave Elman, the right? Esdale State, later on. Or plenary trance, or third term, Chris, testing you. Oh, five. Hypnotic five. coma. Ooh, got it in Ooh, time. What a freaking joke. Use. Don't call I'm going to put you in a coma. Yeah. Like, no, you're not. 
Yeah. <laughs> that would yeah. be a huge bite my that's what you. That's the one you wanted me to say, I assume. Yeah, you yeah, got it. You I got did, it. Yeah. So <laughs> now, uh, the interesting thing about it was uh, Esdale did document it so well being a medical doctor, and it was many, many years later when we'll get to Elman and how Yeah, we haven't got – he's later so on So now we list. get to Emil Coué. Okay. Emil mm. Coué, turn of the 19th to 20th century, he was a pharmacist. And every day – in every, in every way, way I'm, I'm getting, getting smarter better and better and stronger better and better and happier. Okay, don't try whatever to change is, history. Yeah. Better and history. better. Yeah. <laughs> All he probably he, he said it in English as well as French. So, Kuwait, his thing that he taught these mantras that people were saying was he was really the founder of auto suggestion, not self hypnosis, but auto suggestion right. in a waking state where you say your mantra over and over and over, and eventually the critical faculty goes. Okay, I'll let it well, in. And if you're wrapping your mind around an idea, oh gee, could that be establishing selective thinking? I wonder, Chris. Could auto suggestion also be self hypnosis if exactly. you do it in a certain way? Right? And the fact that this caught on, everybody was <clears> doing this walk around every day and every way. I'm getting better and better. You know, there's mantras everywhere. Stay safe. You know, there's just mantras, mantras, mantras. I've been just saying, use. I've been doing it wrong. I've been saying every day and every way. I'm getting, getting better sicker and sicker. No, <laughs> I've been saying better looking. <laughs> ah, ha, ha, there you go. That's good. Um, now listen. All right. So the what he what he gave us was auto suggestion. The idea that no trance was required, and but he fell into disfavor over time, and people went, yeah, okay, whatever, and they just sort of stopped doing right. it. So this leads us to Freud. Dick Award. Oh. Now listen, um, Freud, because he was a crappy hypnotist and Breuer was a great one in his town, Freud developed psychoanalysis and kept people coming back week after week for one to three years, you know, 300 sessions or whatever the heck it was. But what did he bring Freud to the table? Freud contributed the effect bridge. Aha. Uh -huh. Which it's is really interesting. one of effect the ways to do regression. Effect is the emotional feeling mm -hmm. that you get. So Freud would talk about the feeling they had and that became the bridge. And, you know, even, Shh. even our friend Igor Ladohovsky says he uses the effect bridge for re regression pretty well exclusively because it is so dependable. And it's true when the person can feel that bad emotion of the war again and feel it in their body, that traumatized ego state, the Vedic ego state is now executive and it's easy to follow it back to the first time they felt it. Freud was the, the guy who gave us, I don't want to mm -hmm. say the genius because it, it just annoys me too much. But he did give us the effect bridge. Right, he did. And by the way, we do have a YouTube playlist on regression to cause. So right. we'll link that in the show notes or in the YouTube video here. We'll make sure that there's a link to that. But you you'll make find sure that. of that, Chris. You'll find that there. Yes. All right. <laughs> okay, Clark Hull. Now, Clark Hill, Hull, Yale University. Great contribution. Mm. Uh, we got a professor of psychology. He was Milton Erickson's teacher professor, in the early yeah. days. And he wrote the wonderful book, hypnosis and suggestibility and he gave us the great quote we use all the time from 1933 that i first heard tad james use it which is anything that assumes trance causes trance which shows us that we can produce the phenomena and get the trance instead of producing <clears> a trance <throat> now i'm getting the coughing. jerry kind mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay all right now this led go. to understanding psychodynamic loops and what eventually became Stephen Gilligan's cooperation principle in Ericksonian hypnosis, the recognition that it is not something that the hypnotist is doing to the subject, but the two of you are in this communication loop, almost like a conversation. And that's what that is trance. such a great point, because a lot of the times we get people who are confused about doing hypnosis because they come from the script reading world, let's say, yeah. where you are doing something, in, in this case, reading a script at the other person, at them. and magic happens. But that's not the way it works because there's no feedback. <laughs> Can loop. I say how much we, I like, I'm, I'm like magic point, happens? Yeah, magic happens. There we go. <laughs> like here? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so if you treat it like a normal relationship where yeah. there's, I mean, it's not a normal relationship no, when someone's normal, got their eyes no. closed and you're you're talking hypnotically to them and yeah. they're responding, but there's a response involved. There's a calibration oh, loop feedback yeah. involved. And there's sometimes even conversation happening as you ask for information, you get it back or you ask for a nod or you yeah. ask for a hand to drop, whatever it is that's about. happening, right? Like it's not just it. reading a freaking script. It's no, it's not that. All right. Now, look, we got nice. Andre Weizenhofer. So we're talking 1957. Mm. Okay. Weizenhofer writes General Techniques of Hypnotism, and he also writes General Principles of Hypnotism, Volumes 1 and 2. Weizenhofer gave us something great. I believe he was a psychologist. Weizenhofer was right into hypnosis. He was a great researcher. Him and Erickson sort of clashed. They were sort of friends, but uh, Weizenhofer just didn't accept what Erickson was doing as hypnosis. He had much more of a formalized ritualistic mm -hmm. model. And of course, Erickson was 
was correct. But the bottom line with Weizenhofer, why I think he's a great contributor to the science and theory of hypnotism, is he gave us heteroaction and homoaction. You want to explain those? Yeah. So heteroaction is simply the idea that anything that you do that gets a response from a person is more likely to cascade into getting a response to the next thing that you suggest or ask for. Even if it's totally different. Even if it's totally different. Right. So, so on stage, you make people itch. Yeah. And then they start itching and scratching. And then it's no longer bugs. Now you're in the freezing north of Canada. And I'm glad that's ending this time of year. And then what happens is the, the second suggestion, being a harder one to create the cold rather than the awareness of the surface mm -hmm. of the skin, it will take hold because of heteroaction. The first one has worked. It increases the predisposition to comply with a suggestion or direction that is completely different. And in the context of therapeutic hypnosis, it might work where you start with a yes set and the yes set gets agreement. Then you do a compliance right. set. Compliance set is just getting very simple compliance. Things like put your hands face down, sometimes yeah, we'll say, on your lap, voice. close yeah. your eyes, take a deep breath, allow That's yourself right. to go into a trance. There's your compliance set. Yeah. Then we may do some sort of catalepsy. We may create eye lock. We may do a bunch of things and every little easy thing that we get success with will lead to more likelihood of success with the next thing that wouldn't have been so easy to start with. That's interesting because right? I, I saw a pair of oven mitts mm -hmm. that you put your hands in and they were cats. Like, like, like a, a, a weird a ceramic, like ceramic, like a fabric cats, you know, so you can pick things up, but they're oven mitts. Is this a new kind of confusion? No, but you can have one on your yeah. hand and say, look, I have catalepsy. <laughs> Just thought of that then. Okay, now listen. Homo action, similar to hetero action, but the difference is when you repeat the same suggestion with the same person, the result will, will compound and get stronger. Right. For example, on stage, this is used all the time. If you go around a loop, you come back, you know, it's freezing. Oh, you're itchy, you're itchy. Now it's freezing cold. Uh, now it's burning hot. Now you come back to the loop again. Now it's really itchy again. The itchiness will be worse because of homo action. You've come back and repeated the same thing again. Okay, so. Homo same, hetero different. When we're doing deepeners, and a lot yeah. of people watching this have heard of fractionation. So let's say you close your eyes, you go deeper, open and close your eyes again, go deeper. That's homo action too, isn't it? Absolutely. It's just without it the delay. Yep. Well put, Christopher. Mm -hmm. So it is used also in the therapeutic side of hypnosis. Let's get to Dave Elman. We're going to have to turn this into a two-parter, buddy. No, we're not, buddy. We're, we're going... You yeah, think so? we are. We I think are. it's going to be Holy a two-parter. Holy crap, we are. Yeah, because okay, it's already... You know yeah. We're already... We'll do a few more minutes, and yeah, then we'll, 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 we'll make go, it a part let's two. Let's go Dave Elman, and then we'll, we'll do the next one. And then we'll start with Erickson on the next week. Yeah. Because there's a lot. Although, you know that next time, it's our 200th episode. Oh, man. So that could be, well, a good way to start the podcast. Let's, let's 200. get through this. Okay, let's do let's it. Get let's through. do it. So <clears throat> we get now to uh, Dave Elman. Dave Elman, Fargo, North Dakota. Um, little kid, learns all about hypnosis, reads about Bernheim. And Bernheim would find that his patient would go into hypnosis better the following week because of homo action. Right. And then the next week they go in even deeper and Elman thought, well, why are they waiting a week? Why doesn't he do it the next day or the next hour or <laughs> immediately? Elman discovers fractionation. Oh, so there we go. I didn't even know this was coming up Well, next. there you have it because mm -hmm. I write the content. So he's the father of direct hypnosis really to mm -hmm. a large degree uh, where it is no longer mystical wrapped around mesmerism and all these things he's really the the solid modern day hypnotist mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and from elman even though he didn't have a full range of stuff he had so much stuff he did great dealing with stuttering and phobias and all kinds of things he discovered rediscovered the esdale state gave us a means of getting to the esdale state really fast instead of the two hours it took james esdale to do it yeah we'd get there so from the elman, elman outdid esdale and we're still friends with um david elman's son colonel larry elman and cheryl elman his wife and we've stayed friends with them for years they they've kept the elman tradition alive and we, they do a great job elman also did the early regression to cause but very often if you track it he did not find the initial sensitizing event. He found the subsequent sensitizing event. He hadn't followed it back far enough. That took time. But he did. He really took people through that. He did rapid inductions. He pioneered work with some mm -hmm. amazing rapid induction sets. And, of course, fractionation, as we said early on with this. All right. And next on our list, we've got Gil Boyne. Right. Mm. Gil Boyne was around the same time as Elman and later as well. Boyne was great. He did a lot of rapid inductions. He would put people in trance, standing, lower them to the floor. He did really deep work and would transform people very, very quickly at a very caring heart. He's very authoritarian, but he used it very, very well because what Boyne did that was brilliant 
was he combined hypnotherapy with gestalt therapy, Fritz Perls thing. He'd say, now be the father, answer, speak for the father. And he'd work with all these different ego states and interjects and so on and bring resolution very quickly. Okay. And um, he developed excellent regression to initial sensitizing event, which was then taken up by Charles Tabitz. There we go. Who then took, gave it to Roy Hunter. Yeah. And then gave it to you. <laughs> You. It's, about you. about you. it's about there you. It's about you. All right, let's move on. Okay, to so now we got we got to Erickson. Milton, Milton Erickson, H. MD, Erickson. father of indirect hypnosis. He was very direct in his early days. This is a man who had polio twice, two different strains, paralyzed in a wheelchair, colorblind, tone deaf, but unbelievably powerful hypnotist. I spoke to John Grinder once, and I said, "Why is it that?" You spent only three days with Erickson at a time, you and Richard Bandler. He said, because that's as long as you could be in his presence, because you're constantly going in and out of trance. All right. So Erickson brought the entire field Research. of conversational hypnosis, too. Yes. He went very indirect in mm. his latter years and found it very powerful. Phenomenal researcher, the collective papers of Milton H. Erickson, four volumes. It's really fascinating reading short articles by him he really gave us embedded commands and analog marking pacing and leading pacing and lead, stories stories and metaphors, metaphors nominalizations thousands and thousands of subjects that utilization and incorporation incorporation mm -hmm. all of this which leads us to bandler and grinder because they created nlp and they modeled erickson yeah now they model a lot of people ask well what's the difference between nlp and hypnosis well first of all we should probably narrow that down to Ericksonian hypnosis sure thing, because yeah. NLP was, was created by modeling three therapists, one of which was Milton H. Erickson. Right. So right. there's a lot of hypnosis in NLP. Bandler and Grinder, John Grinder, of course, being a linguist mm -hmm. and a professor, they quickly managed to break down the patterns Erickson was using. Erickson did not do Ericksonian hypnosis. He just worked mm -hmm. with patients. But Bandler and Grinder made it transferable so other people could learn it, which was, I think, their real genius. But they also systemized the fast phobia cure, uh, reframing, right. the use of rapport, how to create rapport, the, the meta, meta model, model the they Milton broke down the model. Milton model mm -hmm. that Erickson used, anchoring, et cetera, et cetera. And I've even put the amazing Kreskin on the list. Uh, that <laughs> lovable old humbug I've seen many times live. Um Okay, if you want to put someone and he takes himself way too seriously, Camp, I think Kreskin should probably be in the top two or three. But what he did that I think was a great contribution to the art was he eschewed the belief in any kind of hypnotic state. And he said, there is no special state. You people are wrong. You can't prove a special state. We don't believe in a special state. It's a straw man. But dealing with this, what Kreskin did was he created rapid inductions for stage hypnotists that weren't inductions, progressive testing, just test. Test. Which is test, heteroaction, test. guys. You're getting heteroaction, and they start giving direct suggestion. Mm -hmm. So he created a non-induction induction producing phenomena, which led also to the brilliant work, The Weirdness of Hypnosis, mm -hmm. Hypnosis Without Trance, done by our friend James Tripp. And if you remember the quote from Clark Hall, anything that assumes trance causes trance, if you perform a test and the person goes, oh, it's working, and then you do another test and it's progressively more difficult, you're getting heteroaction, you're also getting the assumption. And anything that assumes that trance causes, causes, causes trance. that Brilliant. trance. Brilliant. So we said James Tripp, another friend, an excellent hypnotist, able to produce phenomena without trance, yeah. which is pretty well what Kreskin was doing in the 1970s when I first saw him in November mm -hmm. 1974. So now we've got Carl Smith, our friend. Carl is a, a fabulous direct well, hypnotist. Well, I don't, I don't think we said, we. I know you want to rush through the rest of the list. You and told we'll me to get rush there. through. I know, but I, I want to make sure we give James Tripp the proper credit here. So he... His brand, he built a brand around hypnosis without, without trance. trance. And I want to make I sure we, we do that justice, right? So we don't want to gloss over it. So No, no, briefly, it is his brand. It is his brand, but hypnosis without trance is, it's still hypnosis, but he does a really nice job of helping people understand that you don't need the formal rituals around hypnosis. You don't need to tell a person, okay, close your eyes, take a deep breath in and allow yourself to relax, et cetera, et cetera. You can still do it, right? Is that not what you said? Yes, yeah. producing the phenomena I, without doing yeah, the Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to yeah. make sure we gave it a little more than well, five we seconds. We stand up for another 10 minutes. All right, there we go. You <laughs> can now move on to Carl Smith. Smith. Carl Smith's a friend of ours. Carl's, uh, <laughs> Carl is a direct hypnotist par excellence. Mm -hmm. He's really, really solid as a therapist, an excellent trainer. We both trained with him. Um, his kinetic shift is mm -hmm. phenomenal. As he says, there's nothing new in it but it's the way he's put it together. I think Carl's given us two tremendous contributions to hypnosis and they are tremendous. Kinetic shift is great. Get the person in a fast trance with a phenomena mm -hmm. and then he's pulling out the feelings and all this and change. I mean, a phenomenal 
powerful, rapid, deep stuff. His second one that I think is brilliant is his mental detox, where he just gives the instruction that every thought, feeling, image that's held you back for the last days, weeks, months, whatever, mm -hmm. will now start coming out and just release them. And then he just shuts up and waits. And the person starts processing all of this crap he's, and he just supports yeah, them. Yeah, he's very good at the idea of waiting, waiting for whatever he's suggested and then he'll wait and it'll happen. He's extremely congruent with his direct yeah, method very of skilled. doing things. So he's in your face direct, but so congruent about it. And then patient yeah. when waiting for the response, as you just said. Yes, he is. Mm -hmm. And he's also really generous. After a training in Toronto, he and I went with Chris to the Wickham, Wickham Social, and Carl kept buying different 12-year-old scotches for me, single malts. And I remember hardly being able to get my head out the door and he paid for them all so yeah great guy very generous marlene hunter i'm mentioning she's a canadian uh medical doctor and hypnotist what i got from marlene hunter i really like was that progressive hypnosis that progression instead of regression where you're dealing with something a future event that causes anxiety that is not a phobia but an anxiety it's it's analog instead of digital mm -hmm. and something like fear of flying i got that from her when you run the entire fear of flying backwards. The rehearsal technique. Yes, uh, and then you write down all mm -hmm. your points and then say the same thing forward. I've never had that fail. Yeah. It's always removed a fear of flying or a fear of giving a, a public speech or whatever immediately in one By session. By scrambling the the normal feelings that you would feel imagining going through a process forwards. When you imagine going through the whole thing backwards with success at the end and rewinding. Yeah. To you can't you have an emotion. Backwards. Used to be worried and right. nervous or whatever it was. Yeah. You can't experience it backwards and it kind of screws up your neurology. It scrambles it and right. it rewrites it in your brain. So it's perfect, which leads us to Chris, the late great Tad James, um, Tad had his own version of uh, NLP training, advanced neurodynamics, I think was his and solid, solid trainer. Um, Tad studied with Richard Bandler, so you're really getting the classical NLP rather than the new code. But Tad was an excellent hypnotist. He was an excellent Ericksonian hypnotist, and his contribution to the art is timeline therapy, mm -hmm. where he took the original idea of timelines that I believe came from Richard Bandler, Bandler exclusively, but he, he structured it and systematized it into a complete method, and he did a brilliant job so people could deal with horrible trauma and so on without abreacting doing it all dissociated, flawlessly, essentially finding the initial sensitizing event, then future pacing it with a timeline, a beautiful method that is a complete therapy in and of itself. And I, I did his basic and his master timeline training, and I think right. they're both just excellent. I'm so sorry he, that Tad's gone. He did not create the idea of NLP timelines. Right. He took NLP timelines and enhanced it and built timeline it, built, therapy, yeah, his own trademark. That's his trademark. Awesome yeah. Yes, tool. and did great, okay. great work. This is The next one is Derek Bomber, not as well known. He was one of my mentors. Derek Bomber uh, was a, a Cambridge-trained linguist, taught in Toronto. He was NLP Canada. It's a different company now. It's not connected with his memory or anything. But Derek Bomber was brilliant because he taught a couple of things really well. He forced us to use methods that would never work. So we couldn't use a particular technique that we knew would work. We had to discard that and use something that might not work. Mm -hmm. And then if we could fix the problem with that, he'd make us use something that could never possibly work. And he built in great flexibility with his trainers, not so much with his students, but with his trainers of whom I'm one. And he had a great ability to turn alcoholics into social drinkers. Right. He said, saying every day, I'm an alcoholic, I'm an alcoholic. He said, it was the stupidest thing an alcoholic could do because you're emphasizing the, the I am identity. statements, mm -hmm. identity statements. Instead, he said, if you're believing you're an alcoholic and one drink's going to destroy your life, he said, the person has one beer one day. Oh, I've fallen off the wagon. I should drink a case of beer and a bottle of scotch. Wrong. He made them social drinkers who could drink and stop couple of glasses of wine, whatever. And he was known for that. And it was freaking brilliant. That's a good, um, I think that's a good empowering thought because a lot of people will believe, oh, you must do this. This is the only way to solve the problem. I.e. in the case of alcoholism, completely stop drinking forever. But if some people, and we're not saying everyone or No, all anyone, I'm saying is he had great results. If someone can become a healthy social drinker, that's a good solution for them. We're just saying expand your thinking, which yeah. actually plays into the whole first point you made, which is about building and flexibility. There isn't only one way to do things. Right. And I'm not saying that I'm not saying something here. I hate yeah. it when you spend half your conversation saying I'm not saying something. No, no, the way you can tell someone's not saying it is they don't freaking say it. That's they don't right. have to tell you they're not saying it. But please don't email me about this. I'm just telling you this is what Derek did, and he did it very well. Yeah, they, they, 
that? No. I'm going to leave my it, say relatives it. Yeah. out. Didn't it's called say minority. Okay. Let's yeah. get to Ernest Rossi and Richard Hill. I'm putting them together here. Uh, Dr. Rossi oh, uh, yeah. was a phenomenal hypnotist. He modeled Erickson. He studied directly with, with Erickson, Erickson, like Jeffrey Tsai did, mm -hmm. who should also be on the list. Did you say Leif Erickson, the, Vi the Viking? No. Oh, okay. I think that was you. Okay, we're going to have to check later. I think you said Leif Erickson. Leif no, Erickson. He, he was a Viking. He wasn't Milton Erickson. And anyway... Rossi and Richard Hill, another friend of ours, mm -hmm. Richard Hill. Uh, I took his training. Out of Australia, right? Uh, yes, I took his training in Mirroring Hands. And this was written by Rossi and Richard Hill. It is phenomenal. To me, this is the new generation of hypnotic techniques. The power of it, it is, is com it's completely non-directive. He found mindscaping to be too directive for him. Wow. And mindscaping has almost no directive. It's drawing from the client. But Richard Hill and Rossi came up with this idea. They have the person look at their hands and just seeing them with curiosity and imagining which hand might be taking that problem. That, what happens the is the person goes right into trance oh, yeah, it's, and the hands move and do all this and people zone out. We've got it in a video in the Academy. It's a completely conversational style but of doing therapy. It goes so deep. It is client centered, mm -hmm. which I had a great conversation with our friend Roy Hunter on this. I'm totally with him. Client centered means the client offers the solution. Mm. The client has a problem. The client works through it. We let them do it their way. We don't force our rules on them or our model of the world but this is so client directed people resolve things powerfully mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it also uses the ultradian rhythm which we go through throughout the day our brains go through a different which cycle. is different than the circadian rhythm yes, it that is. most Ultradians people have heard of mm -hmm. and you can google it the ultradian rhythm they will even give the suggestion that during the ultradian rhythm the therapy will continue through we'll the day. We'll have several ultradium rhythm yeah. cycles throughout yes. the day. Whereas we have ultradi yeah. sorry, ultradian. We'll edit that out. And we'll out. have one circadian rhythm, which is yeah. the sleeping and waking. Yes, yeah, right. That's correct. Okay, anyway, go. so they did great work. Ernest Rossi, Richard Hill, tremendous respect there. All right. And finally on our we list. We get to wrap it up with Igor Letohovsky. The man, the myth, the legend, our friend Igor Letohovsky. Igor is a phenomenal hypnotist. He, I say there are very few people alive right now who I consider to be true hypnotic wizards. There's some well on their way to wizardhood, like the, the young chap beside me here. But wizard... <laughs> Igor, is, Igor is fantastic. <laughs> Not at all. Young, what's that? So I'm just saying, but a wizard... <laughs> you're still just Chris. No, but, but uh, Igor is someone I would class as a, a true hypnotic wizard. The flexibility of his mm -hmm. response, his depth of knowledge, his experience, his ecology of working with people and keeping it ecological. And also he is the guy who's really done so much work on the power of hypnotic gifts. Yeah. He's codified. Okay. So in a nutshell, in, if you look at the Mike Mandel hypnosis Academy lesson yes. one, we teach the idea of revivifying a positive state and he's taught that. And the idea of, if you can take someone, put them into a wonderful, wonderful, relaxing trance, and then give them some sort of, hypnotic gift, some sort of positive resource installation or a reframe or whatever it is that you can now demonstrate in a period of like five minutes, something awesome with hypnosis rather than street hypnosis to stick a hand to a table or stick someone's foot to a floor, right, whatever right. it is. You give them something that's actually useful to change their life in that same five minutes. And I think his newest book, Deep Trans Training Manual, uh, yeah, volume, training manual volume, volume 2, two or something volume like two. 200 hypnotic gifts in it mm -hmm. it teaches. And we have to close and mention Anthony and Freddie Jackwin son and father, uh, phenomenal hypnotist, friends of ours. Anthony did a lot of work uh, in the, his earlier days with Kevin Sheldrake, working on things like the automatic imagination model, yes. which is really foundational to understanding maybe this is how hypnosis works. Anthony did great street hypnosis, phenomenal stuff that's been really well documented and filmed. And of course, Freddie, his dad, uh, hypnotherapist par excellence, mm. um, excellence, not excellent. And interestingly, he came up with the arrow technique, as well as a lot of other techniques that are immensely practical for pain management and yeah. pain relief that has served its, you know, people around the world who've applied this. Yeah. In fact, so I'll, I'll break down real quick two things that I got from both Anthony and Freddie just yeah. individually. So with Anthony, the congruence of approaching people in a street hypnosis environment, also the use of fascination. So he'll often present some sort of card effect or something interesting because that's appropriate to the street hypnosis context or bar hypnosis or whatever's going on. Right. So Anthony is the wizard at that stuff. And of course, by being an interesting, kind person, he can get really good results in any situation, whether it be street, bar, or therapy. Freddie, I would say, 
the thing about Freddie is the charisma and the care, the care. that he brings. Yeah. He comes Great across, charisma. and because he is a truly caring person, he's the guy that even no matter how old he is, he's there at he's three age, in the morning. Yeah, I know. You go to bed no at eleven thirty or whatever at a hypnosis conference. Freddie's still at the bar talking about and demonstrating hypnosis at like two, three in the morning. That's yeah. just the kind of person he is. So he's a very caring and friendly person, warm person. And he brings that to the work that he does, which is brilliant work. And that's what I think makes him really stand out. Now let's close with this. And I concur with everything you said about the Jackmans are great friends and they're phenomenal at what they do. Let's not forget Michael C. Anthony and mm. our friend, the best stage hypnotist I think who's ever lived. What we learned from him that is phenomenal. And what I learned was the power of selling a mentalism effect to increase the power of your hypnosis. Yes. When I say selling, I don't mean, oh, step right up and buy one of these. Emotionally I used to do, I people. was doing mentalism mm. pra practically before Michael C. Anthony was, you know, still in public school. But he taught me really well how to make it believable, how to make it real by bringing the theatrics in. And so I began doing my mentalism more his way. And naturally it then adds to the hypnosis work. Now this works even for therapists and he teaches phenomenally well. A couple of mentalism effects. You can show people in a therapeutic setting, all of a sudden you've got incredible creds and your hypnosis goes even better. So that might, yeah. that's your contribution. By the way, inside of the Mike Mandel Hypnosis Academy, we've got a guest trainer section. And even though we don't include the full weekend training from the Jackwins and from Michael C. Anthony, we've got about two hours freely available for you, even on the 14 day trial of Michael C. Anthony, of Freddie and Anthony Jackwin, Melissa Tears, James Tripp. Right. Who else am I thinking? Oh, Carl I Smith, the whole yeah. thing is in there. Yeah. There's tons and tons of stuff. So if you want to learn from us and a lot of amazing other trainers, join the Mike Mandel Hypnosis Academy. There's Excellent. your sales pitch. And I'm right, just say, you know, you probably, some of you are watching, oh, why didn't you mention me? I should be on that list. Why didn't you we'll mention We'll have to do a part so two. So no, no, we're not going <laughs> no. part two. Just remember this. We didn't even put ourselves in the list. That's right. If we're not in the list, why should you be? <laughs> okay. Uh, there are just too many awesome. Okay, Chris, give us the empowering episode. question. Here's your empowering question for episode 199 of the Brain Software Podcast. Ask yourself, what are the key hypnotic elements that you have learned and who did you learn them from? And they may not have even been hypnotists. That's right. That's right. And now we get to the Meta 5, which is a short one. It's called The Show That Never Happened. Uh-oh. 1974. I saw the amazing Kreskin on stage at Minkler Auditorium in 1974 when I was a telephone operator earning 90 bucks a week. Below the poverty line, I was living with my parents. That's the only way I could survive. And it was terrible. I had a horrible job, shift work, but I worked with 150 women, which I thought was pretty awesome. Now, having said all that, without going into that side of it too much, let's talk about this. So I saw Kreskin. I learned a lot of stuff. I was doing card magic since I was a kid. And I said to some booking agents, friends of agent, friends of mine, I can duplicate what he did. And they, what? So I showed them some stuff. He brought me in to show the agency, which was called Music Shop International. I did stuff for them. They said, we're going to start booking you some shows. Now I've lied for about 43 years and said my first show was January 29th, 1975 on the Tommy Bank show in Edmonton, flew out and did it while I was still oh, yeah. There was actually one a month earlier at least a month, maybe end of November, maybe beginning of December. They booked me at a show to see if I could do it. It was a corporate show, really hard for a new guy. I was terrible. I couldn't hold anyone's attention. I was trying to do this weak mind reading thing that I'd sort of made up. Nobody's listening. People are drunk, coming up on stage, screwing up the effects. The agent who booked me was there. He was furious saying, give them hell. Just yell at them. Like you don't have to take. And I just sort of told them all off and stormed out. And I thought I'm never going on stage again but they booked me on that talk show in Edmonton. So technically Edmonton was the second show. Oh, you lied. I know I have. All right. Thanks everybody for listening. This has been episode 199 of the brain software podcast. We have no idea what's coming up for episode 200, but we know it's going to be awesome. Yeah. So thanks again. And, and good, good night. night. Hey, Chris, as we're recording this, you realize this mm. is boxing day for St. Patrick's Day. I do, yes. So we're gonna we're end recording this the day after St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day. Day. Okay. And we're going to do a song. All right. You're going to, I've not let you practice this, so you don't even know oh, where this is going. I don't know. So here we go. You're just going to join in as you can. Do the best you can. Okay. Okay, here okay. we go. Oh, Danny boy, you're still just Danny, Danny boy. 
Oh, Danny boy. Oh, Danny, Danny, Danny boy. boy. Oh, Danny, Danny boy. You're, you're still, still just Danny, Danny, Danny boy. Oh, Danny, Danny boy. Oh, Danny, Danny, Danny boy. Danny boy. And come what may. And come, come what may. And come what may. may. Oh, oh, Danny, Danny boy. boy. And come what may. And come what may. And come what may. Oh, Danny, Danny boy. <laughs> We're going to go the upper edge. Here we go. And come what may, oh, Danny boy, oh, Danny boy, and come what may, oh, Danny, Danny, Danny boy. Happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you. <laughs>